unidentifiable flying object. <laughs> UFO continues to be a mystery. Wasn't alone in space. Sightings of UFO. Something out there. <laughs> Close enough to be observed. <laughs> what could it be? It could only be one thing. A UFO. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a wonderful episode for you today. We're going to be talking about Dracula. Oh, 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 it's going to be fantastic with me on this episode, as has been for the last, I don't know how many episodes, a bunch, and it's wonderful. It's Nate. What's up, Nate? How are you, man? What is going on, my guy? How you been, dude? Oh, man, doing good. How are you? Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Very excited about this episode. Oh, yeah, man. What a good way to kick off October, man. This I is know. good. It's dark. It's bloody. It's everything we would want. Maniacal laugh. <laughs> That's right. Maniacal laugh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's going to be fun, guys. It's going to be fun. We're going to be talking all about Dracula in this episode and uh, kind of the history. But what really we're going to be going over is vampirism and the connection to like secret societies and even of course as i do tie it into aliens of course yeah. everything everything ties in to everything else it's all connected it's all energy as you know as you've heard because you've listened to this show before so you know you know i want to pre- i appreciate you all thank you so much for coming on this episode episode 99 99 of ufo no this is your break from the propaganda, your break from the politics, your break from the treasonous politicians, and have some fun with topics like vampirism and uh, secret societies. And as Nate had said, it's October, and of course that means uh, it's the time of year for spooky tales, stories, my favorite fall leaves, the colors, the sweaters, the pumpkin spice. Oh, Oh, God. You're one of them, aren't you? (laughs) I figured there'd be a bunch of people love that. Love that. That is, uh, you know, regard, there's a bunch of topics that divide people. One of the most tumultuous is the pumpkin spice debate. Don't need it. Oh, you're one of those. Mm -mm. (laughs) Oh, shit. Well, we all know about vampires. I would hope so. I mean, if you don't. I don't know what's wrong with you, but most of us know about vampires. Some of us are big fans. I know myself, I'm a big fan of vampire movies, vampires. uh, As a kid, I dressed up as a vampire every year until I was like 12. I mean, I love vampires. Oh, it's phenomenal. It's great. It's great. And you know, as a kid, it never really, you never think about it. At least I didn't. And is the way of how sexualized vampirism really is. You know, I mean, especially in movies and whatnot, it's incredibly Mm -hmm. sexualized. But anyways. Power lies in seduction. Yes, indeed. Um, I'm a big fan. You're a big fan. Twilight fans don't count. Nope. Don't count. We don't sparkle here, damn it. Get out of here. So, Twilight fans do not apply. uh, But... There's that aspects mean of you can't listen. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Please listen, but you know, <laughs> but uh, go get fucked all at the same time. Anyways, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's a bunch of appeal to vampirism. I mean, think about this: eating at night, wanting to live forever. These are things I identify with very much. So, <clears throat> eating at night, especially living I forever. That I mean, that's only time will tell. But that sounds tiring, man. <laughs> living forever? <laughs> I don't know. Here's the hard part. You know, you spend so much time, at least some people do. Some people spend so much time thinking about dying that uh, that if they didn't have to worry about dying, maybe they could accomplish something in life. 
Maybe. Maybe. But anyways, I try not to dwell on it because I believe in energy and I believe that no matter what happens, this will energy continue. will transfer. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that transfer is going to look like, but I, I think based on what I can see, based on what I've read, based on some of the people I've, I've listened to and heard scientists and whatnot, that this energy, this consciousness that we don't even know what it is, that moves on. Mm -hmm. Everything else, you can call it a spirit, you can call it a soul, you can call it whatever you want. But this this human consciousness that we we you know ab abide in, that we sur live in. What's the word I'm trying to exist in? This carries on because it's 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 everlasting energy. It's energy pulled from the universe. And and the energy in the universe is powerful. Constant. Constant. So that's where I, I'm like, well, I just don't think it's that simple that your body dies, so therefore everything about you dies. There's there's something about this consciousness. I'm going way off on a tangent here, but there's something about consciousness that I think survives on. So that's why I don't dwell on death. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe that will help some other people to not dwell on it either. Just look at his different thing. Yeah, it's scary because we don't know what happens. But at the same time, it's exciting because we don't know what happens. Like imagine your consciousness moving to a realm that you have no idea what to expect. That... To me, that makes me want to be a good person only because karma, I do believe in karma. I believe in energy. And if you carry a bunch of negative energy around, put a bunch of negative energy out there, well, brother, you're going to find negative energy wherever you land. Exactly. You know, and even in the afterlife, whatever you want to call it, you, you will find negative energy wherever you are because you are laying the path before you in bricks of hatred. Ooh. Ooh. So deep. That was a juicy morsel of I, I blacked out. That what was. happened? What happened? Man. <laughs> oh, anyways. <You> okay? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I pooped my pants. That so, makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Getting excited over here in all my wisdom. So um I don't know where I was going with all that, but basically, <laughs> let's pull back to the episode here. But the true roots of vampirism are amazingly gruesome. Amazingly. It's it's not romanticized in any way, the origins of this. It's intertwined with what seems to be the ancient alien, ancient astronaut theory, going back, far back in history, and then tying into a lot of these secret societies. Um, mm -hmm. On top of all that, top of all the history, all the ancient stuff that we can look at, and, and we are going to look at uh, some good history nuggets, but on top of all that, we're also going to look at several real-life vampires that either considered themselves vampires or believed without considering themselves vampires, acted or, or um, took part in vampire-type activities with the belief that blood meant something for them. They, too, want to believe. Yeah. So yeah. whether it was they actually believed they were aliens, or I'm, I'm sorry, vampires, or that they just believed that there was something about the blood, either way, they behaved like vampires. So we're going to look at several cases of that. But um, I want to thank you all for joining the show. We're in the stratosphere. I'm cruising about 87,000 feet. Nate, where are you at? Oh, I say I'm about there myself. Sweet. Cruising. It's clear good. skies, baby. Clear skies. If you like the mm -hmm. show, be sure to share this episode. Give a nice review everywhere you can. Apple iTunes, Spotify, Audible. These all take reviews. Nice written stars. Give us the five stars. It blends in with all the rest. Hit that subscribe button if you're on Rumble. If you're on YouTube, it all really does help. You can find us literally everywhere. Also, in the show notes, click that 
link, portal to all things UFO No. Go check out the merch shop. Go check out all things that is UFO No. Follow us everywhere. It's got links to everything that we do, everywhere we are, so you can find us no matter where you want to be. Don't forget, you can also donate at patreon.com slash UFO No Podcast, where you get no ads, all my loyalty. I'm going to be adding a bunch of new stuff very, very soon. I keep saying that, but I promise. And you already get bonus episodes every single week along with the new episodes. You get everything early. You get all my love. You interact with me on Patreon. I'm very, I try to be very interactive. Anybody that talks to me, I get right back to you. So we try and be very, very interactive. Um, that's the space to connect with us. Anytime we're going to do something as far as like do something exclusive, you know, we got a Discord chat channel you guys can join. That's all through the Patreon. So go through the patreon.com slash UFNO podcast. Get involved. Click that link portal to everything UFNO in the show notes. Let's get into it, though. I know you do, Nate, but I'm curious if our listeners know the origin story of Dracula. Do they know that it starts with Vlad the Impaler and his father? I wonder. Let's get, let's get into it. So here's how it all started. It all started in Romania, which a lot of you are probably familiar with, near the Dunabi River Valley with the ruler of Wallachia near the region, once referred to as Transylvania in the Carpathian Mountains. Vlad the Impaler Tepes, born 1428. Um, I do have... A little something here um, that I want to look at. Let me see if it'll let me. Oh yeah, yeah. I have a, I have a, uh, I have a, uh, a, a picture of the image. Let me see if I can show you guys. Let me see if I can show you all. I can't, <laughs> but that's okay. I'll put it in the show notes so that way you all check it out later. But um, anyways, it's a, uh, it's a, a wiki link. Of course, Wikipedia link to a uh, map of Wallachia. Very colorful. It almost looks like lungs and a heart, the way they have it colored. It's very interesting. Uh, but Vlad the Impaler, I uh, have a little write-up on him as well. Let us uh, let me see here. Oh, no, it's the image I forgot. Oh, man, he's such a creepy-looking guy. I wish my thing was working right now. I'd be able to show he you. He was beaten with the ugly skirt. That's for damn sure. Yeah, that is for damn sure. He was... Not a good looking man and very, mm -hmm. very evil. Maybe that was part of it. Maybe his looks, yeah. maybe his looks led to him being uh, more brutal. Nobody wanted to touch his pee pee. So you uh, got me. Poor guy. Poor guy. Yeah. No pee pee touches. Um, his father was Prince of Alachia and a member of the Order of the Dragon, which had led, uh, which had a lot of influence at the time. And from Wikipedia says the Order of the Dragon was a monarcha, monarchical, chivalric, wait, chivalric order only for selected higher aristocracy and monarchs, as in the elite. See, so it ties back to elite secret societies. So we're already going there. Founded in 1408 by Sigismund of Luxembourg, who was then king of Hungary and Croatia and later became Holy Roman Emperor. It was uh, It's amazing how they call them holy. You know, back then, you know, they yeah. called a lot of bad people holy. Well, the, the Crusades, <laughs> man, the Crusades were horrible. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was horrific. It was basically a war on non-Christianity. Mm -hmm. and, and it was... Uh, Incredibly brutal, incredibly brutal. And and so many people using Christianity and religion as an excuse to murder and brutalize people. It was it was crazy, man. Crazy. It's a very bloody religion. It's history, man. Yeah, history, yep. Yep. Incredible. Yeah. Um so uh it was fashioned after the military orders of the Crusades, requiring its initiates to defend the cross and fight the enemies of Christianity, particularly the Ottoman Empire. And what's funny is they say enemies of Christianity, but really it was just people who didn't practice the religion. I mean, for the most part, it wasn't enemies of Christianity. It was people that didn't believe or practice Christianity. It wasn't like they were enemies yeah. of it. They just didn't do, didn't do it. They believed in other gods. They believed in other, yep. other scriptures. And, uh, man, it's just, it's just crazy. 
And then you look how widespread Christianity now it is across the globe, and it makes a lot of sense. Oh, certainly. I mean, it's uh, you can you can uh, you can compare that to the Roman Empire. I mean, the mm-hmm. Roman Empire. You know, they didn't care who you worshipped as long as you w- were praying for the the uh, the emperor, but. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the Roman Empire spread throughout the world just saying we're, we're the betterment of the world. We're for the betterment of the world. If you stand in our way, you're standing in the way of progress. And its that's, legacy yeah. left a form of government, whereas Christianity's legacy left a form of religion Yeah, globally. Exactly. Yep. yep. So uh, from this association with this secret society, he became known as Vlad Dracul or Vlad the Dragon. Now, I believe, Nate, did you not say that that was his father, not Vlad the Imperial, yeah. but that was his father? Yeah, uh, Vlad Dracul was actually Dracula's father. Vlad Dracul uh, translates to... Uh, the dragon okay. and our men, our vampire Tepish Vlad the Impaler, uh, was named Vlad Dra- Dracula, which translates to son of the dragon. That's right. That's right. Yes. Okay. So in 1456, after his father was assassinated, he became well known, Vlad did, became very well known for his use of torture. What's interesting is he might have developed this passion from his enemies, his two of his own worst enemies, named John Hunyadi, who was heavily involved in the assassination plot of his father, and the Sultan of Turkey, Murad II, who took Vlad and his brother in per his father's orders before the assassination during the political turmoil. Mm-hmm. And I would imagine that that just, he was probably pretty pretty mean to these kids, I would imagine. but And that's so abusive, and that's where he got the, uh, the Well, the from. interesting thing was is that uh, the, uh, uh, what happened was is what they were sent to, like, is basically what we would consider a prison, but this was more oh. of like a military boarding school. Oh, and, really? Yes. Wow. And so his two sons, Dracula and his brother, Radu, uh, they were in this school, basically a school and training with the Turks for their military and whatnot like that. And, uh, Tepes, Dracula, uh, actually became favored of the emperor and he would, uh, have Dracula bear witness to all the different forms of torture that the emperor would set upon his enemies on the executions. So growing up, Dracula witnessed all these forms of death and torture. So by the time our man hits power, he's like, I'm kind of fucked up. Here we go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Damn, no shit. Yeah. Wow. wow. I had no idea. So, so the boarding school was more like a prison or like a training for torturers. Mm-hmm. Damn, like a trade school for hatred. His, his father willingly gave them up for power over his realm. Basically, it was either he could be, uh, what was it, either imprisoned or executed by the Turks, or he can surrender his sons and give in his power. And he was and assassinated anyways. He was assassinated anyways because, well, back then it was all about power play. Wow. So, yeah. So, man, here he's got this paranoia of everyone around him, Mm -hmm. you know, from from his father being assassinated by those around him. And then he's got all the, the witness to all the killing and the torture he could ever handle, which, like you said, just sets him up to be a ruthless ruler. And keeping in mind that when Dracula went to this boarding school, he was, I want to say, around the age of eight. Damn. Imagine If that. not younger. Yeah, growing up in that. Yeah. And that, mm-hmm. what's amazing is, that was a lot of the world back then. 
I mean, maybe not yeah. to the point of like training young kids to kill, but it was incredibly was. brutal. Yeah. I mean, it was incredibly brutal. I mean, Torture dungeons. Was very common. Very common. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. What a fascinating, well, fascinating, but but brutal world that was. You know, yeah. so many people say, oh, I'd love to go back in time and see these. Yeah. At least have mm-hmm. an escape plan because, uh, man, if you get caught, you are not going to be happy. Not yeah. going to be happy. Your vacation better is going to take dying. a turn. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's better than what they're going to do to you. Hell yeah. So according to ancient records, in the first days of Vlad's rule, a strange comet appeared over the capital of Lagia. So whether this strange comet was a coincidence or an omen or maybe something even more alien, Either way, shortly after this, Vlad took firm control over the area. And even though um, he had taken the throne, apparently the real power actually stayed with people like John Hunyadi, who was a nobleman and a part of the elite at the time. The thing is, is this, is that Hyande was killed, apparently, in battle several months before Vlad took over. Uh, But the other noblemen were still alive, and they, or Vlad knew that they had helped with the assassination of his father. And they thought that due to their rank, due to their status in society, that Vlad was going to be subservient to their authority. But uh, he was not. (laughs) He had other ideas. So one day, he summons all 500 noblemen to his main castle in Targoviste. Castle. um, Beautiful castle, by the way. With his... So he gathers them all in the castle. He gets them all in the main hall. And in the main hall, he signals to his guards outside to surround the place, and capture them. Then he systematically impales all of them on large wooden stakes. Some he impaled through the stomach, and they died fairly quickly. Others, he had the stakes put in their asses before being raised up. So their own weight Force them down the stake, just skewering their insides all the way down. And in some cases, it took them days to die that way. That's insane. Could you freaking imagine that? No, dude. My God. Dude, I get, look, I get severely constipated sometimes and I panic. I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine. Well, here's the thing. Like, it's that's the world's most effective colon cleanser, right there, <laughs> dude. It's more than a colon cleanser. It's cleansing your fucking your whole yeah. everything, man. I mean, look, think about this. There's going to be a moment, right? I mean, they're they're rounded up, they're gathered. You're one of the guys. Let's say you're 439th. All right. And you're mm-hmm. watching this happen, and you're just going, "Please be stomach. Please be stomach. Please be stomach." And then they lay you down and spread your legs, and you're like, it's not stomach. And then there you go. And But that's not where it ends. That's only the beginning. Nope. Them putting it in your ass is only the beginning. Then they raise you up. Yeah. Dude, that first, that first, when your legs first leave the ground. Oh. Oh, boy. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. I don't even want to imagine. Yeah. Yeah, me neither. (laughs) That's, oh boy. So all 500 people, all 500 stakes were then taken to the main courtyard and put on display to for anyone who 
wanted to challenge him or his enemies or anybody else. So this yeah, that is, is going to stay off my property. Fine. I don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah, no shit. So I believe that's in the time frame where he really earned the name Dracula or the dragon son or the, the devil impaler. son. The impaler. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's also said that he killed tens of thousands of people that way. Their, mm -hmm. uh, their corpses left on display for approaching army army. So it kind of, uh, I don't know if you guys have ever seen game of Thrones, but there's moments in game of Thrones where they're really like, you know, crazy army guys, the barbarian guys would like leave bodies like this. Um, up all over the place. And so not, maybe not quite like that, but display them in weird ways. Head cut, heads cut off, you know, staked, um, crazy shit like that. And that was, that was pretty common head on a pipe. Now, if I'm, that was, if I'm remembering the story correctly. In one instance, he had impaled, I want to say around 2000 people. And there was an invading army that was marching toward his land. And they had to pass through a forest of people on Dude, sticks. Can and imagine? can you imagine how long that took? Like you would have to pass through levels of decaying corpses. How demoralizing is that to your military? Well, not Before only you, that, dude. Like, the smell. like that soldiers are marching through there and he's looking around. He's like, and we're off to kill this guy. Why? Yeah, no <laughs> shit. No shit. I mean, clearly there's a, you know, that the reason is he's a despicable person, but but also, yeah, like, like, yeah, dude, can you imagine the I think smell? I hear my mom calling. <laughs> dude, I can't, I can't even imagine. Well, look, yeah, if, if you oh consider God, that terrifying. most armies then, it was, it was not voluntary. Mm -mm. Most armies then were made up mm -mm. of slaves or, you know, yep. whatever, whatever, you know, whatever it might be. So it's not like you could just be like, you fuck this, I'm listed. out. There was no yeah. MIA. There was, or uh, I'm sorry, AWOL. There was none of that. There was none of that. Yeah, you were in, you. and you were going to die. And if and if you didn't die in battle, chances are they were going to kill you themselves. If they found mm -hmm. out you were a coward, if you tried to run, anything like yeah. that. So yeah, and can you imagine a forest, a forest of that? A forest of dead bodies, unbelievable. Two thousand bodies. Jesus. Yeah. And and who knows? I doubt that they went through and counted them all. So that yeah, was probably yeah. an estimate, and I bet you was a conservative estimate. Yeah, considering that it was a total estimated he killed, by the end of his lifespan, they estimated around 100,000 people that he had killed. Yeah. And considering that the population in that area was probably around five 600,000, that's a good chunk of the population, and that's including his own civilians. And like he, he had problems. <laughs> he had problems, yeah. So did everybody else. So did mm -hmm. all those around him because of his problems. Shit, man. So where that leads us to the legend of him drinking blood. Where does that come from? Well, some accounts of what took place, and again, history is spotty, but from what we can gather, some accounts say that he ordered the impaled victims to be arranged in specific ways in his courtyard or in his main hall where he would be in. And he would stand there amongst them, like it, or surrounded by them, and eat with them. And in some cases, it's said that he would dip his bread in their blood and eat it. And so that's kind of where that started. Now, whether he actually, like, you know, vampire type activity of biting and eating them. But this is, at least from what I can see, this is where a lot of that comes from is him eating amongst the dead and eating their blood in various ways, dipping his food in their blood. Jeez. But also let's think about something. Okay. Blood was not nearly considered as grotesque as it is now as dangerous you know we consider blood we're all very you know conscientious of diseases and things like that we're back, also chemical factories yes back then back then 
spilling blood was commonplace. People died all around you. Seeing a dead body mm -hmm. wasn't rare. Uh, seeing somebody you get that walking down the street. Absolutely. Seeing somebody bleed out wasn't wasn't a rarity. Uh, it was the difference was is that and even food, food, I believe, you know, we didn't have these things. Oh, you got to cook a steak to this temperature to make sure you don't get salmonella. No, you know, I none of that. Was no, uh -uh. So think about the amount of times people consumed blood already. Mm -hmm. Raw foods. I mean, That's food right. quality compared to what we have now is significantly. The terrible. only I mean, difference. Maggoty bread. Yeah. The only difference would have been human versus animal. Mm-hmm. And so, even though to us, we're like, oh, my God, he's dipping his bread in the blood. Like, and yeah, that's crazy and disgusting. But in that time period, I don't think that, per se, would have been as shocking as, like, eating a human. Well, prime example of some of the crazy things do for survival and things they eat is there's a place down in Africa where once a year they get millions and millions of mosquitoes and this tribe will sit out there with like these pans and just sit there and scoop, scoop at the air and they'll catch a bunch of mosquitoes and then they just mash them until they're sort of gooey and then cook them like a, like a hamburger and just eat this mosquito patty. And you mean to tell me back in the 1400s that you didn't eat some fucked up food yourself? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah. Gross. <laughs> mm -hmm. there's, some so gross. there's some researchers that believe that he had an actual need for blood, that it wasn't just about the brutality of maybe showcasing your brutality to your enemies and those around you. Cause I could, I could uh, imagine that, look, that's quite a reputation to uphold. So if you've got some squires around you and they're looking at you like you're, you know, you're already insane cause you're surrounded by dead bodies and you're just eating. And then you go, Oh yeah, watch this. And you dip a little bit of bread in your blood. Or, yeah, and uh, they're like, oh, my God, you know, who knows? But uh, but anyways, it's well, well, even in history, blood has always been tied to like a source of power. Yes. You know, like the blood of Christ. Uh, exactly. I mean, you look at our current pope and he has a pendant. He hangs around his neck of blood yeah. that nobody knows what's in it. They refuse to let it be tested or anything like that. Yeah. But he wears blood. Blood has been a, a sacred thing throughout history. Yeah. Well, and you even think about, I mean, how precious blood was. I mean, look, we have blood banks now. Okay, we have, people go donate blood now. Like, they it's literally give it away. Force. But mm -hmm. but back then, back then, it, it was too easy to lose blood. Think about it. I mean, if you got injured, if you, if you, if you got punctured in some way, if that motherfucker didn't stop bleeding, it's not like you had a bunch of ways to stop the bleeding. You couldn't stop Carterize. infection. You couldn't, I mean, well, yeah, carterizing Jesus. But that's why blood was considered and, and is really, I mean, it's the, it's life blood. It's your life. You lose your blood. You use your, you lose your life. Mm -hmm. So that's how they looked at it. I mean, on the battlefield, of course, you're going to have wounds where somebody gets an arm chopped off and eventually they die from it. They bleed out. So, no so I'm, 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 sure, <laughs> I'm sure it was known that if you lose your enough of your blood, you will die. So that's why it was considered so precious. And yes, there were a lot of beliefs and superstitions that through blood you could maintain youth. You could live forever. You could gain power. All these things. There's a ton of ancient tribes. In fact, Native American tribes that believed it, that eating their enemies gave them the power of their enemies. Blackfoot so, Cherokee. Yeah, I mean that goes back. That's that's only goes back 300 years or so. Mm -hmm. So now we're going back way back 14, 1500s. So this seems to be the basis for. Dracula, the story, the 19th century original book by Bram Stoker. 
Love that story. Great. But here's the question. Was it fiction? Or oh, yeah. was it fact hidden in fiction? Was it a real thing that was going on at the time? Was there this real phenomenon going on at the time that he put I, to a tale? I think it, it, it's a lot... It's as true to the story as Bohemian Rhapsody. It's as true to Freddie Mercury. Okay, wait. Explain that. Okay, so you've seen the movie Bohemian Rhapsody, right? Oh, <laughs> okay. You've okay. seen the movie, I was thinking right? the song. I'm like, what do you mean? Oh, you're right. I should have elaborated a little bit better than you. My bad, guys. But yeah, I mean, in my, literally in my head, I'm going, I'm, I'm singing the lyrics of the song and I'm going, I don't know. I don't understand. How is that not Freddie Mercury? <laughs> Cause I'm a dumbass. <laughs> but now I understand but, what you mean. Now I understand yeah, you, the story. You compare the movie to his actual story. The tale of Freddie I, Mercury. Yes. I see what mm, you mean. Yeah. That's how I feel about Bram Stoker's story to Tepish. It's based Loosely on a true story. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think at the time you had publishers, right? That if you Mary come Shelley. with a story that is truthful to what's going on, like brutality and evil like that, it would freak people out. So I don't know if he could have released a book that really told the true tale of Vlad the Impaler as Dracula if he had done it accurately, according to history. But many researchers believe that the symbolism and the knowledge, the esoteric knowledge claims found in the book claimed as fiction is actually disguised as secret knowledge of vampires or vampirism. That wouldn't surprise me either, to be honest with you. Because, again, it goes into secret societies, which we know exist. It goes into Everywhere. the powerful elite's obsession with blood, which seems to exist. We know at least secret societies and the elite exist. What we don't know is what their relationship to blood is and sacrifices and all this stuff that come from a very ancient world that in the elite, the ruling class, this was a known thing. They had rituals to stay young, stay powerful. A lot of them hired mystics and witches to come and tell them the future or the past to help, help you know, like con like consultants of, of the um, miraculous. So, you can look up current times, and there are still elite practices, gatherings, and societies that are held in secret. And just got to do some research, but it still happens today. Bohemian Grove, baby. Mm -hmm. Bohemian Grove and the uh, what's what's the Davos group? I think there's something going on in there. But <clears throat> the name. Uh, from what a lot of these researchers say, the name alone, Count Dracula, from the story, is a clue of the nobility and the royal bloodlines that go into. It was, it was tying that into the royal family, saying, hey, guys, they're into the same shit. His need for blood, they say, is a reference to these elites and their secret sacrificial rituals and needing blood. Another thing that they say that's a clue, a, a, a symbol of other things, is the aspect that Dracula comes in through a window. That a lot of people believe this is a clue into the use of portals or gateways. Now that indicates that it's interdimensional or alien in some way, as opposed to an earthly evil dude. You know what I mean? So, but I always, here's my thing. The window thing always did hang me up because I thought, okay, he can fly, right? He can hypnotize people, right? He can 
drink blood, kill people. He could do all these things, but change form. He can change form, but he can't just sneak into a room without going through the window. It has to be through the window. I mean, to me, it romanticizes it even more. It kind of ties it in with like a Rapunzel type thing. You know, a a Romeo and Juliet type thing. These are where windows are used in a romantic sense. So to me, the window being used could have been to tie this into other fairy tales to make it make it uh, lighter, I guess, using the window. Yeah. Because still, even if you say, I don't, I don't think it would have changed much, it, uh, Dracula would have been just as mystical if you'd said he appeared through a portal in the bedroom. But they didn't. They said window. So I think that maybe, I think they were trying to tie it in with popular fairy tales at the time, like Rapunzel, like... Uh, Romeo and Juliet, all these types of things um, where windows are all vampire movies you see are all have they all have an element of romance to it. Like it's all tied in, like you said, it's very romanticized through the window, uh, relations, yep. all that good stuff. But when you look at what the actual vampirism is, it is feeding. It is, it is food. It is sustenance. It is, I need power. I need life. So I'm going to drink this blood. Through seduction. (laughs) Through seduction. Yes. In a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, I, you know, I think that seduction thing again was used to tie in some kind of love story that didn't need to be there, you know, but who knows? Um, but there's a lot of people that believe that these roots of Dracula, these, these origins of vampirism go back a lot further than the 15th century, that some of these legends go back to the dawn of time. David Icke, for instance, we've talked about him numerous times on the show, um, quote unquote conspiracy theorist, but. Dude, he's onto some shit, man. Weird hands, though. He's got weird, crooked hands. I, I'm not sure what the deal is. I think it's, it seems to me like he's a writer. I've seen a couple of people like this where they're, anyways. I don't. I don't mean to pick on the guy. I just mean he's got like fingers that when you hold your hand like this, they point down. You know what I mean? Have you ever seen that? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, Patrick Stewart has the same thing. Like, I love that. Patrick guy, Stewart look does. At his, dude, look at his hands. I Those didn't know some, that. Some scary looking hands. I didn't know that. Oh yeah. Oh wow. Like I love Patrick Stewart. He's amazing and everything. Yeah. But his hands creep me out. But don't let him touch you. Nope. Well, David Icke compares the legends of Dracula and vampires to the reptilian aliens that require blood. Of course, the obvious comparison is reptiles eat their prey alive. So mm-hmm. the vampires warm blood, you know, that whole thing. But he takes it even further. He ties them in. He ties all this in to the Anunnaki, going all the way back to the ancient astronaut theory that these people have ruled over humanity for hundreds of thousands of years, back to the ancient Egypt pharaohs, all that, that it ties into the elite going back that far. He believes, and and you can see You know, this, if you look him up online, he says this very openly. He believes that the members of the royal families of Europe and the world are assuming human form, essentially shape-shifting, or or are possessing humans from another dimension. I, for one, I hate politicians. I hate them. I mean, they're, they're, they're terrible, horrible people. I know, I know one guy, Brett Borden, one guy that I've met and talked to as a politician that I think is worth a damn. Hey, he's a phenomenal guy, wonderful. Out of Moscow, Idaho, I think, Pullman, maybe Pullman. Anyways, great guy, phenomenal guy, really believes in what he says. But any of these higher-ups, governors, senators, congressmen, 
they're all fucked. They're all fucked. I it wouldn't it wouldn't it would uh, it would shock me, but I would not. I would be like, I knew it if they were all aliens or reptilians, because there's no way they're human. There's no way they're uh, if they are, they're the most despicable humans ever. And you know what? We talked about this on another episode where, you know, last episode. Yeah, attributing attributing evil, evil behavior to, aliens, yeah. to other things because it could they couldn't possibly be human, but they can. Humans yeah. are are more than capable of this. They don't have to be alien, they don't have to be reptilian. It just helps us to not feel so so associated with that type of behavior as being another human. It's like, well, if they're a reptile, it has nothing to do with me. But at this point, I'm convinced if the politicians aren't alien, if the government ain't alien, then they're definitely not human just because of how they are. Like, that's, I mean, Epstein Island, I don't care if you're alien or not, the fact that that even exists. Yeah. Where's your humanity in that? Yeah. If you don't have humanity, you ain't human. Yeah. You know, you're right. Up evil piece of shit walking this earth that needs to be taken out. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Sorry, I got a little fired there. Ah, please all <laughs> fired up. Yeah, your voice, you're, you got really yelly there, man. <laughs> you said it so calmly, though. That's I why try. it's okay. You could, you could say, you could say whatever you want as long as it's very calm, <laughs> very calm and sultry tones. You can totally get away with it. <clears throat> so, a lot of this can sound crazy when you say it out loud to another person. But the truth is, is that this, you know, these ancient rituals, the human sacrifice, look at the, look at the Aztecs. I believe it was them that said that they killed, they, they killed thousands of people a day that there were lines of, of, of human sacrifices waiting, that on these altars they would just one by one just kill thousands of people during certain times of the year. And so human sacrifice is not by any means um, a, a foreign concept of humanity. <clears throat> in fact, in ancient times, it was a common practice a common practice to sacrifice a virgin, sacrifice human sacrifice, 100%. Now, it was almost always attributed to dark powers, some kind of dark power, but nevertheless, it was used. Um, and there is a definite connection between ancient rulers and the people who have control of us in modern times with mm -hmm. bloodlines and power and the right to rule this whole type of thing. Like we're smarter. So we should be able to rule over or we, we know how the world really works. Well, cue us in then you piece of shit. Cue us in. If we, we live in this world, if we don't know how this world works, we should know. How are we supposed to hit that pivoting turning point in humanity? do things right for a change if you're right. kept in the dark. That's right. Because with knowledge comes power. Mm -hmm. And like anything, you control a food supply, you control travel, you control information, you control any of that. You control a population. Any of that sound familiar? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I blacked out. What happened? <laughs> FBI, sorry, blocked you out. <laughs> the CIA's got it. Yep. Yeah, these secret societies, you know, even going back to the 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 reptile thought, is that they do use the or they reference the serpent, the dragon a lot. I mean, even in the Bible, the serpent is a constant symbol for evil. You know, I mean, it's uh, and the and a dragon is is a, is a winged reptilian, is a wing, a winged lizard. So, yeah, it's also believed by a lot of these researchers that these reptilians 
come from the Draco constellation. And they tie that into Dracula, saying Draco, Dracula, pretty close, Mm -hmm. you know. Queen Mary, the mother of Queen Elizabeth II that I believe recently passed away, is a descendant of the sister of Vlad Dracula, the Impaler. Did you know that? Oh, yeah. Make of that what you will. So, you know, ancient bloodlines following into royal families. And if you think like, oh, well, yeah, that's the royal family. They're a, they're a whole nother breed. You know, they're a whole nother case. But, you know, like... They our, definitely are another breed. <laughs> <laughs> our leaders here, though, no, we don't have royal families. Oh, really? Oh, really? You're telling me the Clintons don't consider themselves a royal family? The Bushes don't consider themselves a royal family? I bet you they do, even if you don't. I mean, that that's that's modern-day royal families for you. You know, you. I mean, look at the princes and stuff in like Dubai and and whatnot, Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> it's crazy. Even in our own government, a lot of the people that run that get presidency or get in the Senate, they all have bloodline ties, mm-hmm. ancestral ties to these like Washington, like all these infamous elites. Yep, they're all connected, and the elites have always ran the world. That's right. It's the right to rule. They actually believe that. They believe mm-hmm. that they have the right to rule. Where our blood, our experience, our family has experience doing this. Oh, your family has experience in tyranny? Your family has experience in, uh, in authoritarianism? Great. That's definitely something we want to keep going. Yeah. Glad we settled for that. <laughs> yeah. But let's let's go. So now we're we've gone over some of the history. Let's let's look at some cases of quote unquote real vampires. Okay. Possibly one of the earliest in recorded history is the vampire of Anantis Castle. Some people call it Alnwick Castle. In the twelfth century, historian William of Newburgh was adamant that there was a vampire in the castle sucking the blood of anyone who came across it. So local residents dug up the body, apparently, of the guy who was known to be the vampire, who was a a former guy from Yorkshire, apparently. When they dug it up, the body appeared to be bloated. And they said it was from all the blood it had drank. So they chopped the body up with their shovels, sending blood everywhere, and then they cut out its heart. Just to be safe. So that's one. That's early one. I mean, you know. That's one way to do it. (laughs) That's one way to do it. I mean, I, I that really works, but imagine doing that. Imagine the smell. Now, there's some that practices that if they believed you were a vampire when they buried you, there would be this uh, uh, contraption that sits inside the coffin. It basically, it's a blade over the person's neck. So if they rise from the coffin, they're going to sever their head. Yeah, we actually talked about that in one of our bonus episodes where they found, and they turned it into a whole thing about uh, how... Uh, you know, uh, feminism and, you know, and, and brutality and all that, because it it happened to be, happened to be a female, uh, you know, that was in there, but now, you know, now they've got to where they are not, they're no longer going to classify remains by gender. Did you know that? Oh my God. I hate society. (laughs) They're no longer, they, they, they're, at least they're pushing for this. I don't know it if they officially did it. As a, as a corpse. <laughs> Dude, I mean, for real. It's like, what? Anyways, 
But that's what's funny about that is how are they going to claim? You can look at a human skeleton. The skeletal structure itself will tell you the gender. Yeah, well, that story alone, that story alone, that that, you know, feminism was running rampant in this time when they were putting people to death of fear and the, the paranoia of vampirism and things like that. You couldn't write that. Now, I mean, this was like, this was like two months ago. You couldn't even write that now if that's the case because they wouldn't even identify it as female. So you couldn't say, dude, it doesn't matter. It's not even worth getting into. I just, I just thought it was hilarious yeah. to mention that. That, that that's, is funny. Yeah. Though, but, it's just <laughs> but anyways, but you're right about the blade thing that they would put over it. And so that mm -hmm. way, if the person came to life that, yeah, like you said, they would chop the head off. Crazy, crazy to think those things really existed, that that was, think about living in a time where that was a real mm -hmm. fear. Like, we don't have that. We don't, not, in no, look, we legitimately gather around a gravesite, vulnerable, mourning. And, and visit it often, never once ever thinking that your loved one or anyone could ever pop up out of there and, and actually attack you or kill you. So enough to put a blade over the neck just in case. Dude, that's in, imagine that world. Imagine that society, yeah. the amount of paranoia and superstition running around. If, if they're literally burying people with a blade over their neck, that's fucking insanity insanity i can't even imagine dude i can't even imagine you should do that with politicians oh pff, dude we should literally put explosive no 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 we need to put explosive collars on their necks now <clears throat> while they're alive and give all of us a remote every single one of us and then that way if they do anything untoward then we could just flip that fucking switch and it and all the time they've got that looming over them like I better please them. Well, but at the same time, we don't want them pleasing the masses. That's where we got into this predicament. <sighs> Damn it. How are we going to do this? Well, we just need to get rid of them all. That's all. We just need to get rid of them all. There's no point to keep them. No point. Let's make them. it a new rule. In order for you to run the country, you had to have at least spent 20 years working in the and the average Joe blue collar life. Yeah, dude. Yeah. You're already 70 years old when you're running for office. You've had plenty of life experience to go do something that should give you some character. I a hundred percent agree with that. You, you should not be able to run for office if you have not worked for minimum wage. Mm -hmm. If you have never worked a minimum wage job for at least three years, some real soul debilitating shit, if you have not done that, like go work at Arby's for three and years. And then go pay your, and then make and then make that how you pay your rent and all your bills. And oh yeah. Oh yeah. Else. Oh yeah. Some real life experience, you douche. Mm -hmm. Oh man, don't do don't get me started. <laughs> yeah, okay. Don't, Back to vampires. Don't get me started. I, I can feel it <laughs> rising inside me. Oh, dude, I get I get furious. When I think about politicians, Same. fucking furious. Same. Let's move. Let's move before it's too late. I got to call myself. Sorry, down. guys. Sorry, guys. It's touching. We start talking about secret societies and elites, and it starts uh, tickling that. We're riding know. that edge, man. We are riding Ooh. that edge. <laughs> Borderline. Who would have thought vampires would be so tricky to maneuver? <laughs> Look, man, everybody has their triggers. Some people, it's yep. colors. And words, for me, it's politicians. It's politicians, 100%. I am triggered. <laughs> oh, shit. So two, year, two, century, two, years, two centuries later, in the 1500s, the village of Blow in Bohemia. I'm going to pronounce it Blow. I, it's, it's spelt B-L-A-U. I don't give a fuck what you say I'm supposed to call it. It's blow in Bohemia. Your country sounds more promising. <laughs> you know, here we were just talking about Bohemian Rhapsody, and here we have Bohemia right here. Look at that. Uh, blow in Bohemia. Freddie Mercury would have loved that place. According to legends, was tormented by a shepherd vampire named Miss Lata. 
Do you get my joke about Freddie Mercury because it's called Blow? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure yeah. we were all on the same <laughs> How bad's the joke when I gotta explain it? God damn it! It's over, man. Uh, so the story goes that after his death, he returned to the village, was seen wandering around the village after his death, targeting the local residents, killing them by get this, saying their name, saying their name. He would kill them. That's that fascinating. Is a very strange power. That is fascinating to think about that. I, I don't, that's crazy to me. So, anyways, so residents again, same as the last time, dug up his body. Except this time, they took it out of the village instead of chopping it up. They took it out of the village, then staked it. Numerous through various parts of the body and then lit it on fire. They were not taking chances. Excuse me. Pardon me. That was so rude. Um, I mean, that's what I would do. Man, if I saw some zombie running around, you know, yeah. let's say little Paul is running around the town dead, tormenting residents by saying their name. Bethany. (laughs) So then you just grab him. You tell I, here's what I would hope. I would hope, look, if he's living dead in that case, I would love to see what happens when you do all that to him when he's still alive. So I wonder, I wonder if that's what they did. They did it to him alive. Well, he wouldn't, he wasn't alive. He was undead. So the question then becomes, did he only target the people that he knew before he died or did he just know everybody's fucking name? Dude, <laughs> at, from what I know of Blow, it's a very competitive place. So I would say, uh, yeah, he was targeting his arch enemies like Bethany. So the test is Blow. <laughs> yeah. So another vampire popped up, another vampire tale. Uh, The following century, 1650s in Croatia, a local man named Juri Grando, who enjoyed a long reign of terror for 16 years after his death. After his death. 16 years. Story goes, residents (laughs) saw the undead man. Keep it down. I'm just kidding. The residents saw the undead man roaming the village at night, knocking on people's front doors. How's that different than calling their name? Getting their attention? Anyone who opened the door would soon be found dead. One night, led by a priest, Grando's corpse was dug up and his head cut off. Don't take chances. Here's what's interesting. Here's what I find interesting. That it took him 16 years to decide to do that? (laughs) Yeah. That. That. (laughs) Yes. But also, why were each time, why, uh, so they claim to see these people. Why did they have to dig up their bodies? In a vampire, normally, what at least from what we know of vampires, right, in, in, in lore and, and culture, whatever, is that they sleep in coffins but not in the ground. Not in the ground, right? According to the myth, they don't sleep in the ground, but they do have to sleep on their soil of where they were buried. Oh. So it's kind of like in the Bram Stoker's Dracula when he trans- uh, transferred over right. to Carfax Abbey, he had crates of the soil, the soil. from the castle transported yes. with him and lined the bottom of Carfax Abbey with the soil. Which would make sense, but then how would you go and like rebury yourself in he the didn't place? Go, but, uh, well, not him, uh, but I'm at saying least in, in, that, but, in yeah. these stories. In each case, they they found the person's body and dug them up from their grave. And so I'm just wondering, like, 
were they a physical presence or was it something like astral projection or you know what I'm saying? Astral projection might actually be pretty accurate because he, then we're going to go back to the Bram Stoker. He could turn in the mist. Mm-hmm. He could turn in the mist, go through door jam, go through the cracks. You know, he could seep in wherever he wanted. So astral projection, I would imagine, would be a good explanation for the possibility of that. Well, if you think about the idea that these bodies were buried, the one corpse was even bloated. But the earth is undisturbed. So that's There's what makes cloud. That's what makes me think. But in the case of the bloated body, like how the fuck is the body getting bloated from from the astral projection drinking blood? Crazy. Mm. I don't know. Anyways, it's very, very interesting to think about the possibilities of what these powers could have actually been, what these people may have really been seeing. Or maybe they were blaming the wrong person. Maybe maybe the person they dug up wasn't the person that was tormenting them. Maybe it's just some fat dude inside the coffin. Poor Chuck. Mm-hmm. Too much time at the buffet and got blamed for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. So it desecrated his body. That's fucked. <laughs> that is. That's not very nice. It's not. Well, I can imagine the investigating tactics. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Pardon me. My God. I'm right there with you. Jesus. We're both dying. We're vampires. Uh, Has it died in your blood? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that um, the investigative tactics could not have been very good. Uh, again, there's a lot of superstition, a lot of jumping to conclusion. How much you want to bet? How much do you want to bet? They just dug up some corpses and mutilated them and. And they, and it had nothing to do with the vampire that's tormenting them. Very, very possible. I mean, dude, think about that. I mean, you've got a mob of people that decide it's this guy. Eyewitness accounts are are iffy at best. Oh, and keeping in mind, medical science back then was very, nothing. yeah. There was none. Like, hey, let's just use a crow to pick. You know, like the million ways to die in the West, you know, use a crow to pick the blood out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, they use leeches. You know, I mean, all kinds of crazy things. So, yeah. I don't know. It, it makes me wonder, like, what exactly was going on because you look at the Salem witch trial. That was a huge case of my mistaken identity and superstition and paranoia and pointing fingers and backstabbing. I mean, just the worst possible story. It really is a sad story. Oh, it's horrible, man. And then to and then to add in there that there there actually was something rotting the rye that they were using, and that is is known to cause hallucinations and paranoia amongst a community that is already superstitious and paranoid. Now you add in a substance that's that's literally putting that on steroids. Jesus. And then you you have a couple of of really wicked people that are pointing fingers and trying to blame people um it just is is the is such a crazy case of mob mentality. But uh yeah. Now, let's look at some of the rituals involved in vampire killings. Some that tie theories of the elite doing rituals and drinking blood. And again, some that didn't even claim to be vampires, but they consumed their kill in some kind of brutal way. Whatever it may have been. Drinking the blood, eating them, whatever it was, but... First one we're going to look at is Peter Curtin, known as the Vampire of Dusseldorf. 
when you say it like that, when you say Peter Curtin, the vampire of Dusseldorf, doesn't really strike fear through you. You know what I mean? I would have recommended Peter had gotten uh, a publicist or a PR person of some kind and come up with a better name and uh, say you're from a different town. Dusseldorf just isn't doing it. That's not a very powerful name. It's not. Beware! Oh, hell, Lord Dusseldorf. Beware, Peter, the vampire of Dusseldorf. Nope. Nope. Be like, yeah, next. <laughs> swipe left, swipe right, whatever the one that says no is. Uh, he claimed to be aroused by drinking blood from people and swans. <laughs> I don't know Extra why that's so flow. I don't know why that's so funny to me. I just I mean these poor swans. But like just thinking about him going in and trying to wrangle a swan out of a pond. It's it just, it's just, with the name Peter from Dusseldorf, like, dude, nobody's taking you seriously. Peter Dusseldorf. Who strangles swans. swans. Yes. <laughs> drinks their blood to get in an erection. <laughs> yeah. Like, Jesus. That's the most hardcore vampire I've ever heard of. Why doesn't he have a movie? <laughs> the... The erection of Dusseldorf. <laughs> Dude, for real. For real, man. Oh, Jesus. He's a real boner. Oh, shit, man. I can see the poster. <laughs> I thought to suck your blood. <laughs> oh, fuck, man. He's got an OnlyFans. Oh, an shit. Only dance. And only vamps. <laughs> only vamps. Yeah. It's, oh, yeah. That's perfect. Oh, dude, we got to start a marketing firm. There we go. Copyright. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. What's interesting is he never claimed to be a vampire. He never claimed to be a vampire. He simply acknowledged his arousal by drinking blood from people and swans, and and was just like, no, that's just me. I'm not a vampire. That's just me. Okay, that just makes it worse, though. Right? Dude. God damn. Get help, man. Yeah, he was put to death for <laughs> nine murders in 1931. Wow. Yeah. Joshua Rudiger, on the other hand, believed he was a 2,000-year-old vampire who required blood for vitality. The media called him the Vampire Slasher during his killing spree in 1998. During his trial, Rudiger said, praise, pray. Dude, that's kind of cool. Uh, yeah, you know, like, that is kind of a badass thing to say. I well, guess. coming from yeah. Peter from Dusseldorf, dude, right? this guy's like a fucking Mick Jagger of vampires. <laughs> <laughs> Praise, pray, my love. He was sentenced to 20 years behind bars. Uh, Sean Sellers, teenage vampire, claimed to be possessed by a demon named Ezerot. Cut his wrists and others' wrists, drinking the blood from them. After sh uh, shooting and killing a store clerk in 1986, he murdered his parents. He was executed in 1999. Richard Chase murdered six people in one month in 1977. Same year Star Wars came out. Reports state, I wonder if that had anything to do with it. I hate C-3PO so much, I'm going to kill some people. I don't know. That was a very far left field tie-in, but good job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he... Apparently reports, according to reports, he ate parts of his victims and drank blood, drank their blood during, before, during, and after doing all this, he would have sex with them. Or I guess not before killing them, 
but he would eat them while while he was eating them and drinking their blood. He would also intermittently have sex with them. Crazy. Crazy. Who has sex with their food? You know what I mean? Stuff in the turkey. Oh. Jesus. Getting the giblets. Oh. Good Lord, man. Some Dahmer shit. God damn, you're going to ruin me on turkey. I'm sorry. I take it back. <laughs> I take it. You can't. You can't. It's rattling around <laughs> it's in there, there now. now. It's rattling around. Just some guy fucking a turkey for the giblets. <laughs> <laughs> Chase's obsession with drinking blood started by the age of 10 when he would regularly kill animals and drink their blood, progressing to, get this, injecting animal blood directly into him. Jesus. It's believed the reason he did this was to cure the paranoid thoughts that plagued him. Man, how did he come to that conclusion? I would imagine he's got a few screws loose by, you know, 10 years old, pulling that crap. Did his parents not even notice anything? I, Jesus. I believe this boy's cheese has done slid off its cracker. <laughs> At some point, he got blood poisoning after injecting himself with rabbit blood. And got locked up in a mental institution where the staff nicknamed him Dracula. Oh, I'm sure that helped. Jesus. Give him a nickname that uh, glorifies it for him. Just, uh, yeah, don't don't help him get better. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, shit. By the, time, by the time he was 27 years old, he had progressed to not just killing and drinking humans, but also having sex with their bodies. Prowling the streets of Sacramento, California, looking for unlocked doors. When was this? This was um, 1977. Okay, cool. As I say, I grew up in Sacramento. That's crazy. Uh, <laughs> happens everywhere, bro. Vampires. Never heard about that. Never heard that story before. Really? Yeah. See, that's scarier to me, the fact that nobody talked about it. Yeah. You know, that nobody knew about that. That's that's even scarier than the fact that it happened. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, one of these horrific murders was a pregnant woman that he killed oh. and he ate random parts and organs. Oh. Jesus. Chase was fuck sent that guy. Yeah, fuck that guy. Well, Chase was sentenced to death for the six murders, but killed himself via antidepressant medication that he had saved up to overdose with. Here's here's where I have a big problem with the prison system. You've got a guy like that. Why are we even wasting resources on a guy like that? Exactly. Why are we wait? Why was he given antidepressants in the first place? As you had stated, he has foregone his humanity. Mm -hmm. He's not a human. No. He might look like a human, talk and walk like a human, but he is not a human. He has foregone no. his humanity for something else, for evil, whatever that is. The fact they're even making him wait to die was stupid. They should have just killed him right then. Immediately. Immediately. He's coming right Look, at us. Let me tell you something. <laughs> let me tell you something. You don't even have to hire someone to do it. Mm -hmm. You put it out the to the public. Did it we themselves. are looking for volunteers to help us take out pedophiles and freaks. And by free, I mean freaks in the worst possible sense. I'm talking about the real freaks, the ones that, again, have foregone their humanity. I'm not talking about people who like, oh, I'm a freak. No, 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 no. And they put them in protected prisons. Yeah. For their yeah. Like, what no, the fuck? fuck? Put them with the inmates and let them know what happened. Yeah. Let, let nature pray. It's proven. <laughs> it's proven he did what he did. There's no 
Yeah. There's no doubt he did what he did. There's no mistaking mm -hmm. this guy for an innocent man. Mm -mm. You know, that's the they fear. They would have killed him in a the heartbeat. The fear is, is that if, you know, oh, well, if you if you start putting people to death like that, then eventually you're, you're going to get innocent people in there. Well, now hold on. This, we can prove without a shadow of a doubt, this guy is a, is a, is, is no longer human. He is, as you said, a walking piece of shit and, yep. and deserves to die in the worst possible way. In fact, we're giving, we're doing him a favor by killing him on the spot. We're doing, doing him a favor. a favor. Yes. So anyways, it's like, that's what I don't understand about that is how does a guy like that even have a chance to overdose in prison? Mm -hmm. Like what the mm -hmm. fuck, man? Let us let the family stomp him to death. Like what? Whatever. Like whatever. I, you know, just like what the fuck, man. That's why. That's why in some of these countries where stoning was allowed, I'm like, yeah. If they're a pedophile, stone them to death. Hey, we could bring back gladiator stuff and start balancing out the economy again. Dude, I have a whole like mini story I'm working on on that. <laughs> the whole thing, dude. I'm excited to hear that. Yeah. Anyways, uh, in 1996, Roderick Farrell murdered his girlfriend's father by bashing him repeatedly over the head with a crowbar in Murray, Kentucky. When he was arrested, he claimed to be a 500-year-old vampire named Vasago. Pick a better name, bro. The story goes, Farrell met his victim's daughter... Heather Wendorf, after she ran away from home and joined the vampire clan. So it's her fault. The clan had several members, and Farrell was the leader, meeting in an abandoned building with the words, The Vampire Hotel, crudely painted on it during strange rituals, including drinking Farrell's blood, which all members had to do to join. Gross. During Thanksgiving week, 1996, Farrell, along with an accomplice, Scott, entered the home of Richard Wendorf and his wife, Naomi. Richard was asleep on the sofa when Farrell crushed his skull with a crowbar. Naomi heard the commotion, entered the room shortly after, and Farrell did the same to her. He was arrested four days later and sentenced to death, being the youngest person in the U.S. on death row at the time. However, his sentence was reduced to life without parole. Again, why waste the resources? They're feeding him. They're housing him. They're guarding it's him. coming out of our taxes. Why waste the resources? He took two lives brutally. In no fashion, no shape or form was it even considered uh, self-defense. So, so there, there's no innocence there to protect. There are no rights there to protect. There is no humanity there to protect, to, to, to save, or whatever. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. And please, anybody out there who has a counterargument, to, to this, I would love to hear it. I would love to honestly, like legitimately, I would love to hear the reason why this is a good idea to, to waste resources, in my opinion, on these people. I'd love to hear it. I'd love to hear it. So please let me know. Now, here's what they say about kind of what may have caused all this. So when Farrell was young, his mother was arrested for sending inappropriate and sexually charged letters to a 14-year-old boy lucky dude, uh, 34 at the time, with references to vampires and eternal brides. So big time clue, man, big time clue. There's always something, you know, there's always something in the history of someone. It's not like people, you know, people want to argue that some folks are born evil. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I believe there are things in this world, people, places, that can affect the energy that puts you together. You know, the experience that builds your psychosis or psychiatric state or whatever. 
And that that's what plays a big part. I don't think people are born evil. I think people are molded and shaped. And then that shape shapes their actions. And and that's what you have. And, and so in a lot of these cases, it's not most of the cases. I can't just because I can't think of any right now doesn't mean there aren't any. So I'm not going to say there aren't any. But I can't imagine that there's a lot of cases where someone had a good upbringing, um, a good family, and still turned out to be a psycho. I mean, I guess I'm a little bit psycho, but not not homicidal psycho. You know what I mean? Like yeah, that's, no, they all seem to have a really bad background. Yeah, exactly. Um. So yeah, I, I definitely think that there's something some behind that, and that's why it's always good to treat people well. I mean, that's a a big look. You want to put you want to make sure the world has less serial killers. Don't treat people like shit. There's a there's a good start. You don't know what anyone else is going through. That's right. One of the most prolific vampire killers is Andre Chikatilo. 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 Who murdered over 50 people. Oh, you know what that almost sounds like? I don't even know if I have it here. It almost sounds like my pew pew. I don't have it. Damn it. I'm just fucking up all over the place, man. Anyways. Next time, man, you'll get it. Yeah. I normally have the pew, pew, pew one. Anyway, so uh, that's what it reminded me of. chick I wanted to do a little pew, pew. So anyways, Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, he murdered over 50 people in a 12-year span starting in 1978 uh, all throughout the Soviet Union. He most often targeted young boys and girls, but also women. And even though he didn't have sex with the bodies, which was a good thing, he did mutilate their bodies and removed internal organs and, of course, drank their blood. Jesus. His first That's victim. Sick people. Sick people. His first victim was a nine-year-old girl, Yelana Zakatnova who he abducted, took to an abandoned house that he bought specifically for murders and rapes, stabbed her several times before strangling her to death. He disposed of her body in the Grushevka River, where it was found two days later, but Chikatilo continued to kill for over a decade, dude. For Jeez. over a decade, despite witnesses and evidence placing him at the scene. What? How does that work? How does that happen? I'll tell you how it happens. Government government monopoly. Jesus. Government monopoly on police. That's why. On security. If you had, if you had that person, some somebody had private security and somebody gets murdered under their charge, they're going to find the killer. They're going to find the killer, guaranteed, because that's their job. That's their job. But it, it's not the, unfortunately now, it's not the police's job to serve or protect. It was, uh, that was uh, ruled on in Supreme Court. And some argue, you know, did they ever? I don't know. But, yeah, very sad, very sad. How does that happen? Terrible. He was eventually captured and brought to trial, kept inside a cage in the courtroom, and was found guilty and executed in 1994. So think about that, man. Think how long ago that was. 1978 yeah. to 1994 is how long he went. Man. Crazy. With evidence and witnesses. Insane. There's no, there's no excuse for that. Off them. There's not. No. In the late 1980s in Japan, Sutoma Miyazaki. Hold on, let me try that again. Sutoma Miyazaki killed her four young girls between, or killed four young girls between four and seven years old, mutilating their bodies and drinking their blood. What makes it even worse, though, 
is that he sent letters describing the killings to the families. He was eventually arrested a decade later in 1997 and sentenced to death in 2008. In the early 1990s, in the slums of Rio de Janeiro, Marcela de Andrade went on a killing spree, leaving 14 young boys dead. Not only did he rape them, but he also drank their blood to take their beauty. Of course, he himself was the victim of sexual and physical abuse as a child. According to him, though, he's a devout Christian, an avid churchgoer. Here's what's crazy, dude. He is Mm. currently incarcerated in a medical facility. He didn't die. He didn't get put to death for raping and drinking the blood of 14 boys. 14 boys. See, this is what I'm talking about, man. This is not only does he need to be taken off the planet to better the planet itself, to be rid of them. But why the hell are we paying for this crap? Well, luckily it's in another country, but why is humanity having to pay for it all? Why is any human having to pay for it all? I mean, certainly we're not having to pay for it, but you're right. Yeah. Somebody's having to pay for his existence on this planet being held in that place. And for what? For what? Does he deserve rehabilitation? Does he deserve rehabilitation? No. No, he absolutely does not. No. I mean, look, the people who deserve rehabilitation are the people who are lost by maybe some fault of their own, but there's still hope for them. You take a life, you rape somebody, you kill somebody. Lives. 14, yeah, let alone 14. You yeah. you have again to use this phrase, you have given up your humanity. So why is humanity uh, charged with the task of, of your rehabilitation? As you said, eject them off the planet by any mm-hmm. heinous means necessary. Any heinous means. I think it's only right to let the victim's families be the ones that get to decide how that works. If they want to. I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, that's the thing is like, it should be like, look, here's the deal. I mean, we caught them. We don't know what to do with them. This is your pain, you know, but, but here's the thing. The, the morbid nature of having to go down a list of ways to kill an individual to pick one. Like, that would be, like, you know what I mean? Because the agency is going to have to determine what's in their means. Mm -hmm. And then the people are going to have to look at a list of the means the agency can, can, can annihilate this person. That in itself is a very disturbing concept. And so yeah. even though it sounds like, yeah, retribution, in order to in, enact that retribution, we become what we hate. That's true. And, and unfortunately, unfortunately, it seems like the right answer. It seems like the right and just answer that this individual that has this pain should also be able to dictate the nature in which this person inflicts or, or has pain inflicted on them. But then we're taking on that, that evil and yeah. that energy, just that, flip. you know, th- that's just the hard give part. Give them the free way, just, just flip the switch. Don't, you yes. don't have to get them. Yeah, yeah, like exactly. yeah. Something However, like that. Like, look, like, here's what you could do. Literally come in and have a, a button and say, Mrs. Gonzalez, whatever. Here is a button. This button executes the man who killed your son. Or, don't or have to see it. Don't have to bear you don't have to see it, nothing. nothing. You can simply know that it's done. If you don't want to do this, we will do it. But we just want to give you the respect to know that this can be in your hands if you want it to be. Now, again, mm-hmm. in a time of grief, the problem is, is you might make a decision that you regret. Is that going to haunt you? 
Yeah. You know, anyways, that, I mean, that comes down to a whole nother thing, but, but it really yeah, there's a lot of ins and outs. It it's is. Very it's very subject. hard because it does make you, it, 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 it makes brings you, into question your own humanity. That's right. And is it worth giving up a piece of your humanity to mm-hmm. take what that person already has lost theirs. Killing them is not going to, it literally will give them not, nothing. It take it give nothing. It's over for them. It's over. But for you, you will remain with that decision that you took a life now and what that means as opposed to knowing that they took a life, they died with that on them. You know what I mean? So, but to each their own. I'm not judging one way or the other. I can't imagine what I what decision I would make given that choice. I have no idea. I can't possibly say. I think it would be depending on the matter of what happened. Yeah. Yeah. So, basically, <laughs> this Back was a dark one. This was a dark one. It, vampires, you know, like the, the lure of it. Yeah. You take out the Hollywood aspect. And you get down to the nitty gritty of where the lore came from, the history, the true history of how vampires became the myth that they are. There's nothing good about it. There's yeah. nothing nice. There's nothing beautiful. It is dark. It's cryptic. And it is covered in blood. Yep. It absolutely and is. And a lot of these people, like you just went through this list, a lot of these people consider aspects of vampirism for their actions. Yep. Well, the last one, this is the last one that I wanted to end is short, but mm-hmm. the Countess Elizabeth Bathory of Hungary, you familiar with her? No. Her cruelty towards women in her service is, is legendary. She is said to have murdered over 650 women bathing in their blood to keep young. She was charged with 80 of those murders, but died before answering for her crimes. There's a historian, Raymond T. McNally, who wrote a book about her called Dracula Was a Woman, says that Bathory was as much, if not more, of an influence for the famous Bram Stoker novel than... Vlad the Impaler. I say both. I mean, you know, combine the I, two. This is going to be great. There's a book out there. I don't know if you've read it. It's called Dracula Undead. And oh, it I've was heard of written it. by Bram Stoker's uh, great grandson. Mm. And it is a direct sequel to the original story. And now that you've we're talking about, I remember this and it actually touched base on her oh. in this book. And it is very tied with Dracula. And if you haven't read this book, I mean like the original Bram Stoker, if you, if you guys have never read it, it is a great read, but oh. it reads like letters to each other back and forth. Very true. Yes. It's not, it's not your typical read. Yeah. But this equal that his great grandson, is a typical read and it is a very dark story worth reading. I'm going to have to check that out. I've heard of it, mm-hmm. but I've never, uh, I've never read it. And I got it on my audible. Yes, <laughs> nice. Well, and I do have the scribed alternative in the show link. So you guys can check that out if you would like, but um, yeah, man, I mean, there's again, this all, this ties back to with her specifically the countess ties back into the elite aspect and Mm -hmm. the rituals and all that. But as you can see from all this, the, the, the idea of the blood, something about the blood in every case, they are, there's something about the blood giving vitality, giving them power, sustenance, passion, erections, (laughs) whatever it was, there was something about, the ritual of it. And I mean, this is a big thing in serial killers, the ritual killings, things like that. It all ties back into lore. Yeah. 
It all ties back into lore, and it really can. I mean, look, if you look at the what could have been in some of these cases, what caused these people to go evil? Was it natural? Was there, was it past? You know, like some of these guys, they had a really crazy upbringing, so that's what led them to it. But in other cases like this, Countess, I can't imagine she had a crazy upbringing. Being a Countess, I mean, she, she you know, had the lap of luxury. Exactly. And back in those times, that was a big difference in life. A big difference. So I think she was just psycho. Drunk on power, yep. believed this, keeping her young, which, dude, maybe it did. Maybe it did. Maybe she's still out there. Maybe, dude. Maybe. <laughs> Who knows, man? That would be uh, that'd be kind of a crazy uh, thought that to think that uh, that the countess bla- uh, bathing in blood is uh, is out there somewhere. It'd be pretty scary, pretty frightening, pretty frightening concept to say the least. So, anyways, but with that being said, of course, as always, the big question I have is, uh, what do you all think? What kind of stories do you have? What do you think about vampires? What do you believe about this? Uh, what what stories of vampires in ancient times or or people claiming to be, be vampires that we didn't mention that maybe should be cool? I'd love to hear about it all. Um, if you have stories, you have experiences, you just want to reach out, you can uh, click that link in the show notes and just go to email us. Uh, it's all in there, show notes once again. Um, click that link, Portal to All Things UFO Know. That's where you can access everything. You can go check out the merch. You can go check out where to email us. You can follow us on YouTube and the Rumble. and Everything is in that Portal to All Things UFO Know. But for now, to my people. Hold on, let me get it going. Hold on, hold on, let me get it going. To my people, the Tinfoil Militia. I want you in the ranks. So go, donate now. I got to give some shout outs to my peeps, the tinfoilists, Casey Armadillo, Michael Ralston, Brianna Little, the OG supporter, tinfoil hat wearing Aaron Rice, Jesse, Jet League Teague, Michael Benavides, Carlton Turner, Matthew Morfitt. I love you all. Thank you so much for your support. I cannot say it enough. You all mean the world to me. Um, you too can be a part of the tinfoil militia army. At uh, not tinfoil militia army, my god, the tinfoil militia at patreon.com slash UFO no podcast, where we release a bonus episode each and every single week. You get the regular episode early and ad free, and we're going to be adding a bunch of new content. And of course, there's a lot of back and forth. If you have comments or whatever, on you can interact with me directly on Patreon. So much fun, it's great, we love it. Um, and now, of course, I want to give my general shout outs. To my people, the Black Coast Killer Band out of the UK. The Wet Wired is their merch brand. Go check them out. Thanks for all the shout outs, guys. My friend Casey Leesky, Matthew Morfit again. I uh, want to give you another shout out for giving us ideas. And look, you got another one, and I don't want to give it away because it's a good one, but there's a couple in the works that we haven't done with uh, uh, based on your um, recommendations that I want to do. So we are going, we are working on that. I want to let you know. Um, and then, of course, Ridiculous Patronus 1, Your Scented Memory, Gigi Holland, The Slime King Plays. Thank you for leaving reviews. want to give a personal shout-out to my sister, Christy, the whole family, Jesse, Zoe, Emma. Thanks, you all, for listening. Josh from Camp Verde, thanks for the stories, dude. And, uh, of course, as always, go get that merch. Go get that merch and tag us, UFO No Podcast, uh, on Instagram, and I'll showcase you on the page. Um, it'll be really fun. And, uh, again, join us uh, on um, – uh, you can join us on Discord when you get involved in the Patreon, all that stuff. So super fun times to be had, folks. Super fun times to be had. Nate, where can the people follow you, brother? Hey, guys. Thanks for listening. Hope you're having fun. I am. Uh, you can find me on uh, Boldly Gone. Slowly climbing up there, getting some new followers. Yeah, yeah, so I yeah. just want to say thank you guys for tuning in and bearing with me as we take this journey. 
Yeah, the thought exercise that is UFO No. So much fun. Uh, episode 100 coming up. I got some things planned. Hopefully, it'll come out good, uh, come out with the way I want. But either way, we'll have another episode coming for you and next week. Don't miss it. Remember to check it out. And as I always say, oh, wait. <laughs> before I end, before I end, I meant to bring this up in the beginning of the episode. Damn it. But before we end, I want to say this. I'm going to put a link in the show notes to Blind Mike's stuff. Okay, his social media stuff. I want you all to bombard because I know the aliens are in touch with him and they have his social media. Mark Zuckerberg absolutely is one of these leaders in this. So if you bombard his Facebook page with requests to come back on the show, I think, I think the Zuckerberg and the aliens that have him might let him go long enough to be on the show. So, that's the goal, guys. And if we do, if we do get him back on the show, I'm confident that we can keep him. So that's the idea. Bombard him. I'll put the link in the show notes. Go check it out. Follow Nate, Boldly Gone. Follow me. I got a new Twitch channel. I'll put the link in the show notes. You guys want to hang out. Uh, if you like it a weed and you want to smoke it a weed with me on Twitch, let's go do it. I'm on there every night. Uh, 10 p.m. to midnight, and I'll put the link in the show notes. Anyways, with that being said, stay elevated, everybody, and uh, keep your eyes to the skies. Watch out for the government. They're shoisty bastards.